clinicians really have a problem with this as well. I mean, it is not proven. The efficacy of it is extremely low. There was one review they found between 80 to 100% false positivity rates. Okay, so let's talk about food sensitivity. You know, it's become quite the big market, honestly. Ever since the DNA kits have come out, companies like Ancestry.com and DNA and... Wait, no, what is it? 23andMe, that's the one. So yeah, since these companies have come out, it's really kind of exploded uh, in the past several years. People are really curious about, you know, where they came from. But then they started to head into this food sensitivity market, uh, I suppose. You know, these food sensitivity tests have been around for a long time, just recently marketed by the bigger companies, these big DNA companies. And I just think, honestly, they saw that there was a market for it. And, you know, you can only do DNA for so long. They needed to, the higher ups, they needed to find other products, so to speak, to sell to people. And there's, you know, not only is there confusion, but there's also some foul play, uh, I believe, with these at-home food sensitivity test kits. So what are these kits really? If you if you take a look, there's only a few variations of it. The first one is it's very simple. They simply, if you send your DNA kit in, and they give you your DNA results, and then they essentially look at what your background is and they show you, you know, the certain diet of that area, right? So if you're from Asia, you know, Southeast Asia, or if you're from the Soviet Union, whatever the case may be, they have particular diets. You know, they don't really do anything to personalize it. They're just taking kind of broad data and sending it back to you and you go, wow, I'm, you know, this is great, I'm happy. So the second way to test for food sensitivities is using immunoglobulin. The best way to kind of explain this, there's two, there's more types, but there's two main ones that people might associate with, immunoglobulin E and G. E is more common, they're using it for allergies. However, you know, clinicians and doctors in North America, as far as what I've read, they don't really support that 100%. They have other proven better ways of doing that. So the second version is what these food sensitivity tests use, and that's immunoglobulin G. And essentially it is an antibody. And what you do when you send in your blood sample, it tests your blood with different food sources and sees how the immunoglobulin G reacts. It's otherwise known as IgG, so I'll use that term from now. It's kind of interesting, but at the same time, clinicians really have a problem with this as well. I mean, it is not proven. Uh, this, the efficacy of it is extremely low. There was one review, which I'll leave in the description, talked about they did a test of 100 to 200 individuals saying that they found between 80 to 100% false positivity rate. So it's pretty awful. And if you think about it, what they essentially do is they will take, you, you would take however much blood, you know, in the vial, you'd send it to them and they would essentially test it for the, some of these tests, you know, Everly Well, I think DNA Fit, they show a range of 100 different foods that they test it with. So they'll split up the blood and they'll introduce, let's say, dairy, and they'll see how much immunoglobulin ends up reacting with it, right? And that's the problem because the those antibodies will shoot up after you eat anything right it just depends on how much more it shoots up or how much less so it's 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 kind of a very very imperfect science because it's tough to distinguish okay at what point do we say that oh this is you're highly sensitive to this food so it's a really a poor science and you know these companies are charging 200 300 bucks for this stuff so buyer beware you know another flaw that's interesting with the dna kits and it's, it's kind of a perfect genius business plan and proposition if you think about it. So there's two ways, there's two forms of results that I'll get if I send a DNA kit in. One, they will confirm what I already am and I say, they're good, that's, you know, they know what they're doing over there. Or option B, they tell me something that I'm not. Now, the thing that I'm not could really be anything, 
So let's say they tell me that I have ancestry from Africa and China. I go, whoa, I didn't know that. That's so cool. And then I go tell all my friends that, hey, I'm black and ease now. So that's what I'm saying. It's like either way you go, it's kind of a perfect business plan, but I digress. So there's really no question that it is flawed. I think the best alternative that we have is heart rate variability. Now we've done dozens of videos on what HRV is. I'll do a quick explanation at how it relates to food intake. So HRV, heart rate variability, essentially is gauging your autonomic nervous system. This is the part of your body that is responsible for all involuntary actions, sweat, digestion, kidney function. So all those things that you can't control with your mind, you know, that's the autonomic nervous system. Now, what happens is heart rate variability is me measured usually using an electrocardiogram. So some products have it like the IO smart sleeve and some products don't, but we see a lot of the bigger companies now have the heart rate variability functions like Apple and Fitbit. So what happens is when you record your HRV, it can detect stressors in your autonomic nervous system. So if there are stressors in this example from food, your HRV will be low. It'll be a low number, which is bad. And then once the stressors are gone, your HRV will increase, which is good. The best way to use HRV with food is, you know, you have to be a little bit investigative yourself. You have to keep track of the foods that you eat and measure your HRV beforehand. You know, first of all, you, you do need to establish what your heart rate variability baseline is. This is pretty much what you're walking around at, so to speak, your average HRV. So once you have that number, then you're able to tell after food, how low does your HRV go? And how long does it take for your HRV to stabilize and get back to baseline? That's the main thing that you want to do. The reason that this is better is because you get real time feedback. If you send in a food sensitivity test, which lots of errors, you do it one time. Is it good enough for one time? Sure, but your body adjusts to your diet, right? all the time so this gives you because you know one month or one one year you, it might be a different food so it's something and hrv has so many different functions that this is just an additional function so if you are getting a heart rate variability monitor or a wearable device you're using it for many things you know it's just it's kind of a bonus you know it's an all-in-one solution for your workouts for stress and for food sensitivity as well so you're not just getting one product you know another thing you can use hrv for is alcohol so let's say you like to drink you can test how your body reacts to the different types of alcohol beer scotch vodka wine and you can find which harms your body least and maybe it's worth switching to that one because the lower that harm is the better your recovery and the better you're feeling the next day and you know is is when you once you start making the slight changes right if you are looking at your hrv and you're just taking little pieces of information from there and optimizing your your diet your sleep your alcohol intake you're doing more for yourself in that long term. You know, it's kind of like a daily doctor visit in your pocket if you have one of these products. The one product that we would recommend is our own IO Smart Sleeve. It's got a great app that you can actually choose the event of the HRV based on what you're doing. So if it's food, you can plug in the food that you eat and you can track it all through the history. So it's, it's very easy, it's simple, and it's something that you can do every day, which is really crucial. So at the end of the day, if you have done these DNA tests or you know the food sensitivity tests, and these are things that you like to do, God bless. You know we're not going to say anything against that. But you know if you're looking for a multifaceted device that includes food sensitivity testing on a daily basis, whether you get ours or you get somebody else's, it doesn't really matter. We're just saying that there's a huge benefit to recording and keeping an eye on your HRV every day because this kind of, you know, like I said, it's a doctor's appointment every day where you get actionable outcomes, right? You get results that you can act on, you can change things up yourself and just really improve your life in the future. Yep, yeah, so that's the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching.